Okay, well, um, I'm not as practicing as this as I used to be because I'm now uh, retired, uh, formerly of the School of International University, and uh, I spent the last 20 years in my career. Um, some of my background will emerge uh, shortly. Um, when I was asked to make this presentation, I was given the topic of the obligations of the, what obligations does the value to have for society. But I'm not an ethicist, I'm a sort of uh, economist with uh, interests and uh, qualifications in agriculture, or sociology, and anthropology, which are pretty close to I'm not an ethicist uh, in, any, in any particular way, but I am interested in research ethics. I became interested in research ethics. Uh, through uh, actually engagement with the University of Italy, the School of Development Studies, or School of International Development, is now ethics guidelines, which focus almost exclusively on obligations to the subject. And this was uh, several years ago. Uh, something that we had more or less, she was um, working for somebody else, and we found that interest that uh, uh, overlapped. And we, uh, in, uh, in this worry that there was an excessive concentration on uh, in the ethics, uh, research ethics towards the uh, um, uh, careful subject uh, and to some extent the researcher, rather than broader uh, obligations to society, to peers, to employers um, and funders, uh, which are other obligations I think researchers have. And we developed this into the, as well as the subject that we've always talked about, that has now resulted in publications in several journals uh, and uh, a book. No, yeah. okay. uh, which tries to take up uh, some of these issues and explore them. Okay. And yeah, when I was thinking about the obligations of uh, uh, evaluators towards society and drawing on my own experience as, well, as an evaluator, I should say that I've only really conducted two evaluations, um, both conducted in Bangladesh in the early 1990s and uh, as leaders of teams of evaluators, and the, the result of that experience was that I was never employed as an evaluator again. <laughs> <laughs> it was not terribly good news for those of you who uh, um, want to make a career out of this. But of course, I don't uh, want to make a distinction between evaluation and research, and I completely reject any idea that there is a distinction between evaluation and research. Uh, I think it's really almost non-negotiable. Um, people who think that there is don't really understand uh, um, what's going on here. Uh, but I do realise that it's difficult, often, to do an ethical or good e e evaluation, even if you know what it is you ought to do. Uh, and I have come across people in evaluation situations and research situations who have explicitly acknowledged unethical practices for various reasons. And that got me thinking, I'm not quite sure why, around this sort of catchy phrase of ought implies can, that what you ought to do and that is the idea that you can't ask people, or you can't ask evaluators to do something because they ought to do it if they can't do it. If you're a psychopath, you can't really ask people to him, to him or her to stop killing people because they are a psychopath. Um, it's, uh, you're probably with somebody else. Uh, so I thought that I'd, I'd, I'd take, uh, take that up and look, and look at it and uh, look at whether we can have, a, you know, why it is, in, in, in fact, that we often don't do what we subconsciously know that we ought to do. And in some cases, we do things uh, that we think are good, which outsiders would say, uh, or the right way of doing things, uh, are not the case. Um, and we don't see uh, an ethical or any other sort of objection to doing what we actually do. And this applies across evaluation and research. Because most of my examples will come from research, but most of that research is evaluation research. Okay. Whoops, we got wrong. Okay. Okay. Uh, today, uh, I think it would be a valid objection to say something like me that development is not what it used, used to be. Yeah, when I first started the development research, I went for three years. Uh, it took six weeks to get a letter from where I was, uh, home, and well, back again, if you were lucky. Uh, there was no telephone within 70 miles up a road that took three hours to get up. We went and we went for good. Nowadays, uh, 
that sort of approach uh, is, is very rare. Uh, development, as, as I see it, has been hollowed out and replaced by short-term consultants, uh, people coming for short trips, and through the extensive use of mediators, brokers, and minders, and so on, who mediate between you, us, uh, and I think probably all exclusively uh, um, uh, Western uh, OECD country uh, systems, and the objects of our study who are predominantly non-OECD countries in very different situations. So development is, I acknowledge, not what it used to be, but I don't think this, in a sense, fundamentally changes the, the situation as far as evaluation is concerned. In, in my first serious job in development, I ran up against many of the evaluation problems that I want to go on to talk about. I ran up against the, the politics of evaluation, um, and I ran up against the limits of my uh, social science disciplines uh, in equipping me to do uh, valid and, and, and ethical research. So, uh, the, the first series, well, it wasn't the first experience I've done, but the, the previous experiences in Peru and so on, was in really in doing research for small holiday tea, tea in Malawi. Uh, and uh, the, the, the general lesson for this one was that the small holiday tea scheme in Malawi was set up by the Commonwealth Development Corporation with British aid funding, basically in order to allow the multinational corporations which own the tea estate industry to continue largely unaffected by the uh, nationalist uh, movement uh, within, within, within Malawi and, and, and Malawi. Uh, yeah, the Malawi smallholders and politicians got small-scale uh, plots uh, as long as they tea industry was able to continue producing tea at uh, high rate wage levels and so on and so forth. And any attempt to uh, uh, discuss this or explore this or research this was um, really, I was manipulated into a situation where I was not allowed to address that as In fact, at some point, I was explicitly banned from researching on small of tea. Uh, despite that, my work resulted in rather large profits for the tea industry itself, that's what we can go into. Uh, after that, I worked in northern Nigeria for another five years, this is the late 70s, uh, which led to a large scale irrigation. But again, it became very clear that any attempt to uh, explicitly address the, the real issues of why they developed irrigation in North Nigeria, how they developed it, it's been absolutely disaster, uh, and continued to be disaster almost ever since, with the large scale uh, was inhibited by powerful political interests, both on the recipient government side and also on the donor side, and with connivance from the multinational, uh, multilateral donors, particularly the FAO. Uh, an ironic story about how after I uh, left Nigeria, I uh, moved <coughs> back as a member of the FAO uh, evaluation team looking into large scale irrigation. Uh, when I was first uh, approached by the consultant who was doing it, uh, my name was put forward to FAO because of my reputation I was opposing large scale irrigation in North Nigeria. I was, I was not acceptable. So they recruited someone else uh, who had been a long time uh, different. Uh, uh, irrigation guru. Yeah. But you know, being a sensible person, uh, looking at qualification on this, you can't even talk to me about it. You know, I persuaded him that the last irrigation didn't have a future in the north of Nigeria. But it so happened that uh, for various mix ups, he ended up uh, in Rome, and the rest of the team didn't get that comment. So, so he felt he had to write a report uh, based on his time staying in the literature. So he largely did that JGS for my publications, and he said, Large scale irrigation doesn't have a good region of Nigeria, there isn't much water really, and uh, there uh, is hardly any flat land. It's not the Indo Atlantic Plain, which is what irrigation is since the colonial period of the argument of what it was like. It was what it was like. So, of course, he was then not acceptable, and the consultants came back and did a couple, they got me again. So I went to the official and uh, spent the whole six weeks uh, arguing with uh, other members of the team. About, about this and trying to say, well, look, you know, this is the evidence of, um, this is the evidence, uh, uh, the schemes just don't have a future, etc., etc. In the end, we managed to write a report, and uh, there's a lot of story about this. It results the, the main opposition to me reading Fred Forsyth's novel about the Biafra War and realizing, yes, the Northerners were using, uh, were unpleasant not 
uh, and uh, that they were diverting resources in order to build their own political constituencies and so on and so on, which is, which is most of my story about it. Um, okay, and uh, eventually we, man- we, we managed to persuade this, we won't go forward because we went to FAO and FAO and ditched it because it was not consistent with the FAO's mandate at that time to develop agricultural resources, and for them, in the semi arid area with large rivers and apparently flat mm-hmm. land, irrigation is the answer. Yeah, they disappeared. Um, for, for, uh, we won't talk about this much longer because you'll get stuck on it, but there are similarities from the colonial period and the uh, evaluation of the colonial period. I can find practically everything I had to say about uh, small large scale irrigation in Nigeria from colonial reports uh, of their irrigation experiences in Nigeria. More recently, since the uh, early 1980s, I haven't worked much in Africa, very little in the Many work in South Asia. Focusing on poultry production and human development so, uh, in Bangladesh. <coughs> uh, the story in Bangladesh comes back to bite us a little bit in a minute, and some of it's a little bit close to home uh, for some of us. Uh, but basically, the story is that Bangladesh was a basket case in the late 1970s, uh, but uh, subsequently, its agriculture has grown quite rapidly. <coughs> and it is much nearer to a situation of food self sufficiency, and over the long period, Bangladesh appears to be uh, have less money metric poverty than usually, and in fact, see to have much higher indicators of some uh, indicators of, of human development. Uh, but my experience here was that, uh, in fact, irrigation was being promoted, a small scale groundwater irrigation uh, was being promoted by the World Bank, and therefore many of the leftists. Uh, wanted to argue that this was a capitalist enterprise inconsistent with the agrarian relations in, 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 in Bangladesh and would not result in poverty reduction, human development, and so on and so forth. Uh, so again, there was an academic discourse which went against uh, the particular orthodoxy which was very pervasive in that country at that time, which I think has been militated in the long run, uh, but it was not particularly popular. Uh, my two um, evaluations in, that, in, in Bangladesh really, one coincided with the Chittagong cyclone, which was in the north of the country, which the cyclone didn't affect. It was to do with a large-scale uh, non-governmental organization that pursued constantization uh, activities, together with various uh, infrastructure, uh, agricultural production, uh, woman-oriented, micro-credit types of activities. And uh, the details of that uh, uh, evaluation are not particularly interesting. But the, what was interesting about it was the cyclone came toward the end of the evaluation study. And at that point, uh, all cooperation with the staff of the NGO stopped because they all had to rush to Chicago, to the south of the country, in order to conduct uh, relief and rehabilitation activities. And this was the NGO had a listen out of relief and rehabilitation uh, NGO that had diversified into the activities. But they, they just disappeared, that we were sort of left to uh, finalise the uh, field work at the time, and uh, we disappeared down, then we went down to uh, uh, Dhaka to write the report. Uh, this was now some two weeks or so after the cyclone, during which the relief and rehabilitation had not been brought into interaction. And there were two lessons there. The first, the first one was actually what they were able to do, this relief and rehabilitation uh, organisation, was very limited. They had no uh, established presence in the area. Uh, they were focused on uh, drinking water and, and, and such activities. Uh, they didn't have the local uh, contact. They didn't have the local infrastructure support. Them. They could only survive down there for about five days, and then they came back to like and uh, had houses and uh, get on with their normal activities. But the other thing that was very noticeable was that uh, they were very prominent in the news, along with other development engineers. We all have to. Have to demonstrate that connectivity. And their main presence in the media uh, around this was when a very large Russian airplane arrived in Dhaka uh, and uh, was opened up. You know, so there's an attack coming out, what you saw was crates of this and crates of that, and uh, the director of the NGO and several staff standing there and pushing things in this direction and other direction. And uh, we, we found out um, that what was actually in this aircraft, which had arrived very quickly from <laughs> was in fact they, a lot of out of date medicines, uh, some, uh, a few blankets and so on and so forth, not terribly important in a subtropical area or a tropical area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and half of it was full of bottled water. Well, even 
half of a minimally profitable plate full of bottled water is not going to make much of an impact on the lives of some 10 million people who are directly affected by the South in, 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 in the South of Bangladesh. There were difficulties in getting it there. There were, of course, there would have been difficulties in getting it there. And it would have been practically no use at all. But it was great media presence, uh, as the director of the NGO uh, told me. And it really sort of directed me towards some priorities that uh, these organisations uh, sometimes manifest. Of course, this is an exaggerated <coughs> story, and it's uh, a bit like The other thing that happened in the evaluation there was that uh, our report was not acceptable. Because we say, well, you do what you do well, but you're not really doing the right things, partly because they were not focusing on the well-being of the victims, uh, arising out of science capabilities and function this type of approach. So uh, I think that many of us now think are much more important ways of doing it. They were doing rather good uh, mother-child uh, clinical work uh, and, and so on and so forth. They were building some nice bridges, but they weren't supporting the roads that connected between them and so on and so forth. So it was very difficult to say uh, anything other than, well, yes, you build nice bridges and you have nice mother-child faith, but you know ability to demonstrate that you're having much effect on the well-being of the people that you're involved with, let alone the distribution of effect. And basically, the director of the NGO said, this is just not acceptable. Why are you picking us up? We're no worse than any other major NGO. And I agree with them. So why did we have a report that would challenge our funding, which I'm sure you don't particularly want to do, but true, I uh, and, uh, and, and will result in us being uh, marginalised and losing our funding and losing our mandates and not being able to write this and people will lose their what support we are able to give them. So we locked up for a long weekend and had to rewrite the report in such a way that it was acceptable and difficult bits put into the agencies and it um, wouldn't be published and so on. And so so uh, that was my experience as a um, one experience as a practical it was actually to analyze the uh, uh, river rehabilitation activities of another NGO in the South of Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, I, I won't digress into that because it's, um, uh, it's, it, it does tell a substantially different story. Okay, um, certainly I did work quite well, and earlier I had worked with quite a lot of activists NGOs, and something like that. I don't agree, I looked a lot at my other credits. Nowadays, and the of the and so on, and whether these are in fact the magic bullets uh, for the development. Uh, and um, uh, my experience has been is that the intellectual academic foundations for the argument of uh, women's agency, the uh, main, uh, the most important uh, uh, route through which human development can be achieved, is uh, apparently seriously uh, lacking. And it's, and it's to some extent a, a story around that that I want to tell uh, about how uh, evaluators uh, really can, uh, should, should, well, it seems that evaluators should address in meeting their obligations to society, uh, which I would like to discuss now. Okay, but first of all, I think we need to deal with the politics of evaluation. Many people will say to you, oh, this is just the politics of evaluation. You know, this is the politics of academic activity. Uh, we have to engage in it. We have to play the game as best we, have, uh, we, we can. And we all know that uh, it's ridiculous to try and argue that we have. Um, uh, we, we can be neutral evaluators, responding uh, in the best in, in the best interest of society to the opportunities provided by our funders, and clients, and so on. Uh, participants in the development industry uh, all have interests, political interests, financial interests, uh, emotional interests, intellectual uh, uh, commitments, and so on. Whether they're on the funding side or on the funding <coughs> side. We need a, a proper sociology and anthropology of the development industry, and not just an economic side. But I think we have to accept that most participants uh, wish for success or outcomes. So let's set aside conspiracy theorists um, and uh, uh, some sort of uh, idea of malign capitalist organisations seeking only to exploit the poor and so on. 
I don't want to engage in that because all that's true uh, in some cases and so on. So, but I take the assumption that everybody who participates in this country has the best interests of society and their uh, clients uh, and the subjects and uh, interests. And this is usually captured in the evaluation uh, uh, term. The uh, evaluation is there to prove and improve. It's there to prove that what you're doing is worth doing, and it's there to improve what you're doing. And I'm not quite clear where this phrase comes from. It's much more uh, widespread in the sort of Western third sector, or uh, uh, British third sector, uh, uh, in, in third sector, than it is in the development industry, the international development industry. But there's a, it cannot be escaped one status. So there is a contradiction between these, these two. Uh, mandates for the developed uh, You know, to prove that uh, an activity is successful, will ensure, we're likely to ensure future funding, uh, future livelihoods for those who are promoting it, prestige for those who have promoted it, and well-being, perhaps, for those who are subject to it. <coughs> but improving, the improving method, the idea that your approval will help them improve, necessarily implies that there are lacuna, that there are things that they could have been could do um, that, uh, and, and perhaps should have been doing, but they're not doing. And it's very difficult to combine these two aspects in <coughs> one particular uh, report, one particular uh, response to the evaluation opportunity. Sorry, I don't know what's going maybe an early question the final one. But then again, you have an occasion to prove it's like a particular case for proving that it's a valuable activity to secure future funding and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, politics, of course, of, of this proving group does not just arise at the, the interface between the evaluator and the immediate um, uh, managers of projects uh, or um, managers of uh, policies and so on and so forth. It, it, it's pervasive. It's from Commissioning through design, through conduct, and into dissemination. What gets commissioned? Who gets evaluated? Of course, we know it's not a, it's not a, a, a random sample. Uh, it's likely to be a highly biased sample. So things get evaluated if somebody wishes to promote them and thinks they have a good case by the way they to do it, or if they wish to knock it down. And a new manager comes in and they evaluate the projects of their predecessor because they want to say change the funding that sort of area to this sort of area, and you evaluate if you, and you get a justification for doing so, and then you go ahead with your predetermined uh, agenda. Um, commissioning, uh, you also evaluate instead what can be evaluated. And again, I think this comes back to what something that Alistair was saying. Something that can be measured, something that will pass as science and rigor and neutrality and so on. So. What is very interesting is the design of the evaluation. We pay uh, a lot of lip service nowadays to the necessity for mixed methods evaluation, but mixed methods evaluation is extremely difficult to conduct in practice. Uh, evaluators of their academic disciplines, or their political commitments, uh, or their development commitments, commitments to the right, right, right uh, Institutions uh, may have predilections for certain types of design, of course, the RCT fan and the is uh, <coughs> through or swept through. Uh, I think it's probably, hopefully it's near the top of its uh, way, but you never, you never know. Uh, but there are facts, of course, uh, and, and there have been other facts, and there will be other facts. Anyone who knows the history of development knows that we've been around some time. The microcredit is just uh, one of the examples, but it's microcredit was an important thing in the 19th century in India. They set up cooperatives based on the large scale approach. They were resurrected in the 1930s like, um, uh, in Gurgaon, just outside Delhi. Uh, they replicated uh, in various other places and it re uh, uh, resurrected again in the 1970s and Bangladesh and so on. Uh, politics is uh, represented in the conduct of I I evaluations. Who's chosen as the project leader? What are their methodological predilections? <coughs> how much resources <coughs> they devote and time do they devote to other people? How they edit, you know, collect in and edit and then present the final reports and so on and so forth. It is surely not the a coincidence that I've never asked to read the evaluation subsequently, despite the ones that we've received. And of course, increasingly we are having to work through brokers, minders, 
uh, and are subject to the control of the evaluation industries. Uh, sorry, uh, of sponsors, whether it's commissioners or project leaders and so on. So to ensure that the correct performance of the evaluation comes to the conclusion that is usually being decided well before the evaluation is undertaken. And then there's a politics to dissemination. Of course, the most obvious way is the way critical <laughs> evaluations are not available to other people, but the confidentiality is required, uh, the restrictions on publications, and so on and so forth. So, politics is pervasive, and I accept all. But I don't really want to talk. Oh, I don't know. I want to get into what's uh, very important. And I get to skip over this too. As an economist, uh, you know, given the prestige of quantitative social science in, in particular, I want to focus on this rather than positive level. Uh, I want to emphasise that, that, that actually statistical results are extremely fragile, whether they're simple tabulations and t-tests or whether they are um, uh, much more sophisticated econometric and statistical modelling or simulation types of methods. You know, the quantitative social science has multiple degrees of freedom with which to fix the results. In the old days, I used to teach cost-benefit analysis, very uh, professional and, and so on. And uh, we, we were convinced the cost of it was a reputable scientific discipline in which we could bring about the better allegation of resources, etc. Et et but when I actually did co cost benefit analysis being practice, it was very absolutely clear to me that what you had to do was have the right result. So I worked on consultants, American consultants in Bangladesh on their uh, a project for the Bangladesh Water Development Board, and they, we, were, we were doing cost benefit analysis five projects, and my work showed that. Three had some viability and two definitely didn't. The three that had some value were rehabilitation projects because there were huge sunk costs and you just had to do some marginal expenditure. But the, 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 the two that were attracted were major new capital investments and they just didn't pay. Well, the Bangladesh Board Board said to the my employers, nobody has ever turned down a proposal we have made for a large scale irrigation or water control, flood control project before. And if you put this report in, you will never be employed. In Again, uh, and uh, the leader was very brave. He said, oh, okay, do that. He said to me, you know, I could easily fix these results because you've given me all the programs, your spreadsheets, etc. All I have to do is increase the yield protection or reduce the discount rate or change the capital investment margin, etc., etc., etc. And lo and behold, it turns out to be positive. And I said, yes, you know. We can teach people how to fix the results. We've got multiple degrees of freedom. We can fix the prices, we can fix the interest rates, we can fix the yields, we can fix the hours. You know, it's, all, it's very easy to do, and most people won't go to the trouble of working through the details in order to see whether the you know, micro assumptions are actually uh, Okay, so the, that was the point. And statistical analysis, it is also a good um, the, the outcome is, in a context of policy science, where there is an imperative to do something, you, result, you end up with a lot of false positives. False positives are far more likely. I mean, when you get the result, this is a good project. Result. This is a statistically significant result that warrants policy intervention. It is far more likely that this is a false positive than that it is a true result. And this arises both because of the basic process of statistical procedure, but most importantly because of research bias and research commitment. Or researcher interests that you you know you don't get a paper published if you've only got uh, you've got a non-significant result. It's hardly possible. In, in, in. Okay. Right. Um, I was going to uh, say something, give an example of what I consider to be research about. So it's really coming again quite close to it. Recently, in 2013, the Lancet published a series on, on Bangladesh, which attributed Bangladesh's success almost entirely <coughs> to health innovations and microfinance. Uh, particularly as distributed through uh, uh, the well-known NGO BRAC and the innovations largely due to ICD and the other. And they produce a case for this. Now, unfortunately, for their case, uh, the improvements in health and the decline in fertility, which they uh, cause this, actually precede the innovations that they claim were responsible for. Those trends precede them and, and, and went up. Now, the, now, that's on the topic. The, the serious uh, academic case against it, empirical case against it. But what's more interesting involved is that I think there are 13, 14 individual authors, or joint authors, and so on. So, no more than that, but in this year. Every one of which 
was I an employee of ICDPLP or BRAC, uh, or had been an employer of them, or was uh, uh, had been a, a consultancy relationship with them, or had been an institution which had trained many of the BRAC uh, <coughs> people. A lot of these people. Only one of them is the head of BRAC, so that's it, it. So fit to declare any of that as an interest in reproducing its narrative in a prestigious <laughs> So when I ask questions about declarations of interest, I think they do extend more broadly to the sort of financial interests and so on, or a direct administrative uh, control. Uh, the other person who was with me was Amartya Sang, a great admirer, and uh, supported it uh, strongly, but the findings are, of course, consistent with their general story about what's wrong with India and what's right with Bangladesh. And I would argue that they're quite wrong about what happens in Bangladesh for the reasons that I won't go through to it. So the story's not that simple. So what I want to ask you to do is how does bias persist? We, we know, all know where it comes from. It comes from interest. And it, comes, it persists because the supply and demand for bias results in you know, a, a, a price at which bias is, is supplied. Okay. Public policy institutions uh, are mandate driven to do good. But actually, they're highly resource dependent and they lead to an imperative to improve. And if they, it is to improve, they have to, they have to, be, uh, um, have to be constructed in a certain type of way. And the way it is constructed is through a process which we call institutional isomorphism. That is, they are induced to adopt best practices. In the current regime, best practices are RCTs and evaluation. You know, in the old days, people did evaluation, but they didn't call it that. Nowadays, it's impact evaluation. It's totally more rigorous than new kind of business, very little to what went before. So on the, on the one hand, there are sorts of the, the bureaucracy needs to get money. If it needs to continue getting a large grant in order to continue employing people to have the prestige and status and the satisfaction to the this board. That's the nature of bureaucracy. I don't see anything wrong with that, but we need to understand it. But the more interesting question is why individuals comply with the mandates that they are to provide grants. Well, they apply to find that there's employment, obligation, personal identity, support practices, generality, cognitive dissonance. I don't deny that people feel uncomfortable at certain, at some point in their career, about what they're doing. Usually when they're doing their PhD, we supervise PhD students, and they come to us and they say, you know, this isn't, this isn't, well, this isn't right, this isn't working. Uh, but if I follow this, my supervisor won't like it. My supervisor will object because my supervisor has an agenda that I want to say, or oh, I won't get publications, or it won't count as good economics, and so on and so forth. So you have to deal with this cognitive distance, the distance between what you should do and what, in fact, your incentives are afraid to lead you, lead you to do. Okay, institutional isomorphism derives from resource dependence. You, know, you have to get resources from people, and it's not the market, it's from you know, governments. NGOs, uh, donations, and so on. Okay. There are three types of isomorphism. It's coerced isomorphism, where you're forced to do it. Everybody's been forced to do um, uh, what that kind of technique, planning by themselves, uh, and so on, and so forth. Uh, donors require it, the, the funders require it, uh, etc. Et There's the method isomorphism. Anticipating that you will be forced to do it, you adopt it voluntarily. In fact, you present yourself as a cutting edge frontier uh, institution which has adopted um, what's that matrix? Uh, I can't remember. Um, okay, you adopt best practice, you adopt evaluation, you set up a monitoring evaluation department, you uh, get up and support you, you mimic best practice, not because you think it is best practice or uh, at least initially, but because you know it's going to be required to get your funding. And then there's normative isomorphism, and that's driven by professionals. Professionals who bring in their ways of doing things from other environments and say, this is the right way to do it. We do this in the United States, we do this in the UK, in Europe, uh, uh, Japan, or wherever it is, Australia, the leading in the federation, it seems in many ways. Uh, and we have interest in promoting this because, of course, this is where I get to this our, 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 our love. Okay, so it's a question. And then there's what I call, what I, what, what I think this results in is what I call delinquent isomorphism. You know, people would be very uncomfortable with this, this term. But I, you know, thinking about it, I'm quite comfortable with this idea of delinquent isomorphism. I mean, delinquents do what they do voluntarily. Uh, well, unless you read their own book, my hormones, and testosterone, and so on and so forth. 
But it leads to them doing things that are foolish, uh, to commit crimes, uh, to, to do what they shouldn't do, and so on. But that's a dictionary definition of it. Yeah, I think at a certain point there is a knowing, self-conscious uh, adoption of practices uh, that have a certain form and a certain justification and warrant in a certain particular context, but knowing that it won't actually result, won't be conducted in that way in this particular context. So it's an open secret that evaluations do not conform to norms of good science. And anyone who does look at the sociology and anthropology of the development industry, and there have been some works recently with this, will see how uh, that, that, that this is not an unsupported statement based on um, maverick um, experiences, my own personal experience. Okay. So how do we manage this? Well, the, 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 the situation that you're faced with and what you're asked to do is inconsistent with your normative values. You experience cognitive dissonance. So the mental stress due to having two or more impactful years. Of course, I want to have a career in development. To have a career in development, I've got to get published in the Journal of Development and Economics. The Journal of Development and Economics requires me to do an RCT or to do instrumental variables estimation, etc., etc., etc. Uh, and so but if the data don't warrant this, if the context doesn't, uh, um, it, 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 you know, I shouldn't really do it. But of course, I can do it. And I can get statistically significant results and so on and so, on, so forth. But what this does to us is it changes us. You know, our mental stress leads us to be different things. And I just refer there to the theory of separation, as it begins with over, which says, you know, we are lived beings in circumstances not of our own making, but doing things that are to some extent of our own making, resulting in things that are to some extent the result of our actions, even if not the deliberate and subconscious one. Our history leads us to become things we have not intended. You know, many people end up in, uh, in terms of doing things that they can't, you know, wouldn't they say, well, we wouldn't have done this to any graduate students or PhDs, things like that, but now this is what we have to do. But it results in people literally not being able to think, write, or speak certain things. I had a collaboration with, with, with someone once, uh, which fell apart because we just could not write the same things about uh, the topic that we, we were dealing with. It was inconsistent with our identity. But my identity was the pursuit of truth, of course. Uh, their identity <laughs> was uh, uh, a particular part of well, a particular type of development. Let me go. This is more interesting. This is the first slide, okay. 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 Uh, what, I, what I would argue is that the response to cognitive distance is often the, the well known uh, cognitive biases that are so celebrated by Daniel Cameron and the behavioural. Uh, economists and so on. But I don't think they are natural in many I don't think many of them are natural in many, many circumstances. I think they are the result of our experiences. They are acquired. You know. But these are uh, Ben Goldacre's uh, chapter on why clever people do stupid things. And it is true that clever people do do stupid things uh, in many cases. And these are the well known uh, confirmation analysis and so on and so forth. What I want to talk about is how are they acquired? Or, or do they just exist? Okay, we know that we should adopt the norms of science, whether it's quantitative or qualitative social science. We know that uh, quantitative social science should undertake hypothesis testing, and there are rules and regulations about that which we should demonstrate to the problem. And we know that quantitative social science needs to be reflexive, to be very careful about uh, the problems of, uh, of uh, the, the involved, involved. So, but what do people actually do? Well, quantitative economists and sociologists engage in practices of data mining, model polishing, p hacking, and harking. That is, hypothesizing after the results. And then, I'm going to run a rational, you get a positive approach, and then you rationalize it in some sort of way. We also know that evaluators are required to pull punches and spin their findings in a way that is acceptable, but may not be uh, a neutral representation of what we have. And we also know the quantitative inquiries particularly those that are economically right, ventriloquise their values into uh, the responses that they report. You know, it's quite easy you know, uh, to ask the question, why do, uh, when did you last beat your wife? And of course, induces an answer, uh, well, you know, um, whatever, you know, etc. <laughs> One I used to practice hard is, is to ask people who works harder, men, men or women. And of course, the answer you get very much depends on the context in which you ask it, uh, the preceding questions and so on and so forth. 
you know, and what you report will generally be what it is in fact that is consonant with your interest in your assumption. Then why do they do it? But well, I do think that career first ambitions and context and structures of power is really the way you have to understand this. You have to understand how people operate. And then how do you uh, reconcile this with their consciences? Well, they adopt ideas to avoid cognitive dissonance. Whoops. Okay. These are the standard ways in which you adopt your behavior. Okay. I'll go to the side, I won't talk about it. You change behavior, you change the understanding of behavior, you develop new ways of understanding, and you ignore conflicting information. Those are the standard ways of it. And those should be very familiar to people in situations of values. What can we do to go forward? Well, first of all, I don't think we should always be asked to be able to have positive scrutiny. Secondly, I think we should change the pressures for performances of compliance. Okay, and I give you some literature there on compliance. So why is it that people comply uh, with the things that are, uh, uh, are basically should be rejected? Um, I, I argue strongly that evaluation should be a normative practice rather than a calculative one. It is one that we should do because it is right, and the way that we should do are right, rather than because they're in the interests of some people or other, other people who try to establish it. We should practice good social science, and we should try to become better people, resisting uh, the pressures of compliance under. Uh, and we can do this through a process of called moral selling, uh, that is, to become better people by self-conscious reflection and, and reporting. And this, we have again, they have some lessons. Um, uh, I'll skip over that and talk a little bit about social work. Someone else mentioned social work. Social workers, when they are going, are required to write reports upon their performance in their work. Reflective reports. They are allowed to write. I, I, and so in the evaluation issue, you could say, how can I do as an evaluator? And there is an opportunity to reflect on some of these conflicts and so on uh, and, and so forth. And uh, I think that that would be helpful for it. And then we should conduct more ethnographies of A and 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 A and